you. The next item on the order paper is a motion on a living over the shops scheme. I will ask the clerk to read the motion, please. That this assembly recognises the rule that repurposed and attractive residential space above retail premises can play in promoting the success of town centres across Northern Ireland. Notes that making high streets high quality locations to live as well as work can aid the economic recovery for COVID-19. And calls on the Minister for Communities to consider establishing a live, living over shops grant scheme to assist landlords to convert space above retail premises into residential accommodation. Thank you. I call Mr Jonathan Buckley to move the motion. I to move. Thank you. The Business Committee has agreed to allow up to one hour and 30 minutes for this debate. The proposer of the motion will have 10 minutes to propose and 10 minutes to wind. Uh, one amendment has been selected as published on the Marshall list. I call Mr Buckley to please open the debate on the motion. Deputy Speaker. This year has brought challenges that were previously unimagined by members in every corner of this House. We are facing a battle that was entirely unforeseen and it will be hard to estimate a time when we can re resume some element of normality. When this Assembly was restored in January of this year, after a long absence, we joined with a keen desire to confront issues that have long plagued this country. One such issue is the decline of the high street and economic activity within our town centres, coupled with chronic housing stress. Of course, these particular challenges long predate the viral pandemic, and societal trends have long forecast that less people are living and shopping within our town centres. With this in mind, we need to be prepared for the realistic possibility that COVID-19 will vastly accelerate the decline of our high street and be prepared to take action to mitigate against this. This is why I stand here today in supporting the establishment of a Living Over the Shops grant scheme and call upon the Minister of Communities to take, into serious, to take this into serious consideration alongside uh, direct actions right across the executive to reinvent our town centres and address the lack of affordable housing stock. The Northern Ireland Executive first introduced the Living Over the Shops scheme in 2002 to provide grants for the conversion of empty or underused space uh, above rental, uh, retail and commercial premises into private rental units. This grant scheme ran until 2008-2009 and contributed to the creation of 101 new properties within our town centres before it closed due to budgetary pressures. An analysis of the need and demand for a new lots type initiative commissioned by the Department of Communities was published in January 2017. The analysis reported that over the last decade, demand has strengthened considerably for private rented units within our town centres due to, increased, uh, due to reduced mortgage availability to younger households. This demand is compiled by an increase in the vacancy levels of non-domestic properties across Northern Ireland. Another report commissioned by the Department indicated and identified that there, the vacancy rate of non-domestic properties in the 41 towns across Northern Ireland was estimated to be at 22.3% in 2016, which is considerably higher than any other region within the United Kingdom. This totals 3,595 non-domestic pro uh, property vacancies, of which 1,015 were quantified by Northern Irish councils as being suitable for residential conversion. These statistics are clear, Mr Deputy Speaker, and visible proof that the total vacancy of non-domestic properties within town centres more than satisfies supply if we are proactive in encouraging conversion under the Living Over the Shops scheme. And to, to satisfy that potential supply meets a convincing demand. As I have previously alluded to, there are substantive demogra demographic and population trends which impact considerably on housing needs. Northern Ireland's population is expected to grow an estimated 8.6% by 2039, taking the total population to beyond 2 million people. This increase, coupled with an ageing population and changing trends in home ownership and composition, places further pressure upon the need to improve housing supply stock across Northern Ireland. Age-based demographics also tell us that Northern Ireland is projected to face the challenge of supporting an ageing population 
with the number of people over the age of 65 set to increase by approximately two, from 260,000 in 2016 to approximately 410,000 by 2039, an increase of almost 60% over 23 years. In addition to this, a falling birth rate also suggests that the working age population will decrease. This will have the same knock-on effect and implication for housing, as housing supply of smaller homes, one or two bed units, will be important in meeting this demand, particularly as younger generations have smaller families on average and older people seek to downsize from larger homes in their later years. Whilst this evidence uh, serves as evidence for the long-term challenges that we are set to encounter, we must also recognise the very present task at hand in relation to COVID-19. The viral pandemic has already compounded the difficulties faced within many departments, and we need to be realistic about how that will directly impact the high street. Emerging evidence suggests that lockdown is set to change consumer and business behaviour on a long-lasting basis, with a more permanent shift towards working from home and favouring digital retail. The knock-on effect of less footfall has been well documented in Belfast in previous months. As offices adopt to a new normal, droves of staff working remotely have weakened retail and hospitality units that were heavily reliant upon their custom. In addition, the seismic shift in internet sales presents a real threat to the high street, as online sales have soared, now accounting for over a third of all sales across the United Kingdom, up from less than 20% the year previous. Statistics produced by retail expert Springboard estimate that the footfall in our high streets fell by a staggering 79% in April 2020 compared to the same period last year. This evidence very clearly raises profound questions about the future of our town centres, which must be scrutinised and addressed in order to prevent the continued decline of our Northern Ireland High Street. If COVID-19 continues to accelerate the shift towards online retail and service access, shop vacancies rates on the High Street and in retail parks could rise rapidly as stores inevitably become financially unviable. With all of this in mind, we must ask ourselves the question, is now the time to seriously re-image and reimagine our approach to urban planning? In addressing the onset struggles we face with COVID-19, we must now be willing to reflect the changing role of town centres from retail-led to multifunctional. With respect to behavioural change, we must recognise that there is less demand for retail space in our urban centres. Rather than letting high streets fall into an urban decay, we can revive our urban spaces by repurposing them, replacing shops and offices with desirable and affordable accommodation. Further provision of housing within our town centres has the potential to generate social and economic benefits, including increased investment and spending and the creation of jobs. Following this path has the potential to curve behavioural changes and to broaden the appeal of our town and city centres. The case for demand of such residential properties is compelling, and in establishing a living over the shop scheme, we can grasp the real opportunity to revitalise and re-image our town centres. With the vast array of vacant non-domestic properties available within our towns and city centres, there is a role for government now to take the initiative in encouraging such plans to repurpose urban centres. I believe that now is the time for action. Now is the time to re-image our towns. And while I fully recognise that a living over the shops grant scheme cannot in its own right address the challenging challenges facing Northern Ireland in relation to housing supply and regeneration of local communities, but it is it's a start and it can help set the tone following the global pandemic that we've faced in COVID-19. As a party, we have in the past raised the prospect of town centre regeneration challenge funds with local councils. Chamber of Trade and others could bid for annual money to help them develop a range of projects in town centres. In terms of housing, we are clear that there is a need for a comprehensive look at whether the current structures are fit for purpose. So we must accept there is a need to work together, holistically but proactively, on these issues in the days ahead. It is vital 
that any future programme reflects the challenges of COVID-19, market fluctuations as well as the ideas of those who stand to be affected if it is to demand confidence and ultimately uh, realise the clear potential it offers. We accept that is isn't going to be something which one minister should be left to take forward on their own. The establishment of High Street ta uh, Task Force provides a useful vehicle to take forward this work in a timely and effective manner. I appeal to the House today to support me in my desire to re-image and reimagine our town centres as we uh, react to one of the most uh, affected uh, periods in our time, the reaction and the response of government in tackling the decline of our high street and the demand for social housing in a post-COVID environment. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Thank you. And before I call the next speaker to move the amendment, can this old Belfast councillor welcome that old Belfast councillor back from his period in isolation? You're very welcome back. I call Mr. Framakan to move the amendment. Uh, how long have I got you? <laughs> Ten minutes. That's good. Kion uh, I want to begin by thanking you and all of those within this assembly who have sent me kind words during the course of my Ill illness. It was much appreciated. Karja, the motion we debate today, which calls on the Minister for Communities to consider establishing a living above the shops grant scheme, which would assist landlords to convert space above retail premises and turn them into a res residential accommodation. On the face of it, it would seem to be a good proposal and it says that it will play an important role in promoting the success of our town centres, making high streets high-quality locations to live as well as work and can aid the economic recovery uh, from COVID-19. Again, on the face of it, this proposal seems to be fine, and of course, we should consider all proposals which come to the table for discussions. I just wonder if this, this is the right way uh, to, to pursue this particular allocation of housing. We have always believed that any proposal which helps in dealing with the dereliction of the many business premises with empty spaces above their premises needs to be looked at, but it can't be looked at in isolation and has to be looked at with the other serious difficulties we face across the housing sector. The proposers of this motion do not speak of the problems uh, which this area might bring, especially how it was run the last time round we pursued the policy of living above the shops, not only the cost, but what areas will benefit from this proposal. Some thoughts I've had which came to mind are how areas will be chosen for development, what the development cost will be, who controls the new build, how they will be allocated when completed, and will they be allocated on need? It does not lay out the many difficulties there will be in, in overcoming the serious problems of access uh, to proposed homes. Uh, moreover, regional planning policies state that they would need to comply with normal planning and environmental considerations. For example, facilities for the storage of fuel and refuse and the space for drying clothes. And what of parking? Planning talks about level access, which would be considered in the circumstances of each particular case. How is rent set in the new refurbished properties? Do they remain in the ownership of the property owner or are they handled? Uh, are they to be handed to a social housing provider to allocate from increasing waiting lists, or are they purely a private development? In one of the papers we received, it listed rent charges on the private rented sector throughout the north, but they were old, old figures. Who will set the rent to ensure they are affordable? These are just a few thoughts that come to mind. I have looked through the research papers, much of which were based on English schemes that were heavily funded. But the paper provided by the public and corporate economic consultants who, working back then for the Department of Communities, issued a report in September 2016, which stated on page 4 that Belfast is identified as an area with significant challenges regarding its non-dependent domestic, domestic vacancies, and the LAT scheme is only likely to work in areas outside Belfast city centre. In fact, it seems to remove Belfast City Centre from any possibility of developing a LATS housing scheme, especially at a time uh, only a number of years ago when there was a campaign in inner city communities to have housing in all its aspects uh, built in the centre of Belfast. As a member of the old Social Development Committee, back then when looking at town, the town centre regeneration strategy, we realised from early on that housing 
was crucial uh, to the future of towns and villages. These strategies offered hope, and I believe pe uh, people were disappointed that they never materialised. I believe that when looking at strategies for the future of towns and villages, they can only work with other sectors, especially local government. In fact, today many councils are actively working on the development of major proposals on major shape-changing schemes which will change our communities for the better. It includes business, sport, environment, and housing, and much more. City deals which takes in, uh, takes in council areas surrounding, including Belfast, Derry, and councils in the North West uh, have their own city deals, as does other councils who are working uh, growth deals. All of these will have as part of their proposition housing growth over the next 10 or 20 years. I believe that councils need to be convinced that the LAT scheme will provide the type of housing which will make a difference to their area. I believe the proposers of this motion need uh, to be working with local government to ensure all aspects of dialect election is dealt with, including how to deal with the dialect election in our town, town centres, especially shops and waste land which has lay vacant for many years. I again emphasise that this should be part of a strategy, not just a scheme chosen in isolation uh, from a housing strategy. The proposers of this motion know that and all, housing in all its aspects are right up there for the Minister. She has committed herself to come in front of our committee and cover any issue we want raised. Uh, she has spoken of her commitment to start dealing with the tangled web uh, which makes up housing and to put a, strat a strategy in place which deals with the many problems we face. I have no doubt that she will look at this motion when, and do her best to deal with this matter. But I again emphasise that this cannot be done in isolation from all other aspects of housing. So I would argue that our amendment offers the best way forward and I would ask the proposers to reconsider their motion and allow the amendment to have the unanimous support of the Chamber. Let, it, let this be part of the, uh, an overall strategy, which will ensure that all future decisions made on housing developments and allocations are based on objective need. Karja, we are in difficult, difficult times, but I have no doubt we will work our way through this. When we do, we will need to work together to provide decent housing. I believe we have a Minister for Communities who is deeply committed in tackling the question of housing, especially the provision of modern housing for all people in need. I would ask that you support the amendment. Thank you. Can I ask you just to formally move the amendment? Just I beg to move. Thank you. I call Mr. Mark Durkin. Deputy Speaker, every member of this assembly will be all too familiar with the long waiting lists for housing across our constituencies. 38,000 applicants in total, but with fewer than 2,000 new social housing units being built every year. With the greatest need being in my own constituency of Foyle, where we have nearly 3,000 households on the housing waiting list, I welcome any innovative measure that will help to ensure that everyone across the North has a roof above their head. So I commend the members from Upper Ban and North Belfast in bringing forward this motion. I will also be supporting the amendment, which I believe to be complementary, as I believe a living over the shops scheme that begins and ends with grants to landlords has more potential pitfalls than benefits. A 2016 report, Fran McCann has referred to it, by the Department looked into the need and demand for such a scheme. I am sure the Minister is familiar with it. And Updated information on the data provided would be very useful for a fresh look. I do hope, however, that the Minister will go beyond it and undertake a comprehensive assessment of the viability of such a scheme, taking into account how many homes such a scheme could create in each constituency, affordability and town planning issues in terms of convenient access to public services and facilities. An updated, an updated assessment would also, of course, have to reckon with the brutal reality that many shops in our towns and city centres will struggle to stay open in the coming months and years ahead. There are few areas of public policy that housing doesn't touch. The labour market, education and health 
are chief amongst those that it does. That is why we in the SDLP have called for a 20-year housing strategy that would incorporate supply, affordability, regulation of the growing private rental sector and tackling homelessness. The solution to our housing crisis is not simply increasing supply. It is about increasing supply of affordable, high-quality housing for sustainable communities. Encouraging private landlords to develop empty space above commercial properties requires careful consideration and strategic planning. There are clear benefits in terms of repopulating our town centres and generating much more economic activity. Living over the shop schemes also make use of existing infrastructure and provide housing much more quickly than it takes to build entirely new houses. Yet, while we all want to see new homes built or provided, there is a risk of rushing in with grants and ending up with housing that is both unaffordable and unsuitable for the people in the greatest housing need. The departmental report I have mentioned cited research from the Centre of Cities that shows that city centre living is most likely to appeal to young, single professionals. They certainly do need housing and are part of what makes city centre living so vibrant. But the majority of people I need that are in housing need are families with children. It is not just a case of making space above commercial properties habitable. We should identify the potential pitfalls and learn the lessons of such a scheme in the late 90s in England. The weakness in that scheme stemmed from its failure to consider access to public services. Families, in particular, need convenient access to doctor surgeries, schools and play parks, as well as needing parking. Without consideration of these issues, accommodation above shops, I fear, will only promote transience rather than the long-term sustainable communities that we want to build and that we need to create. I support the amendment. Thank you. Mr Roy Beggs. Thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, I too uh, rise to support the motion uh, as listed. And I would like to thank Mr Buckley for having uh, brought this motion, uh, indicating the importance of a new living over the shop scheme or something like it, to uh, promote and encourage our town centres and to address this change in retailing, the high level of vacancies that exist there. There is a problem and we need to address it. Um, once the pressure has, uh, was on our town centres from out of town shopping centres, but as others have indicated, it is actually even moved on from that. And this recent period where uh, we have been uh, having the effect of COVID and having to live with it has exacerbated this situation, exacerbated perhaps the movement of retailing to the online retailing and has reduced the footfall and the turnover in our town centre shops. So there's additional pressure there. This in turn has created further vacancies. And it's important that uh, we arrest that decline and get foot footfall into our town centres. If there are vacancies, it makes our town centres less attractive. So it's important that we address those vacancies, uh, that we encourage such schemes as delivering over the shop schemes, which can reuse that, uh, that vacant property. And I think, as Mr Buckley has indicated, we may need to look at the overall uh, planning policies within our town centres. There is no point having planning policies which were there assuming shopping patterns of yesterday. We need to be more flexible. I myself recall, uh, when coming to this assembly, getting temporary accommodation uh, for, for an office in the town centre. It was the only location I could get with disability-friendly access, and I literally had a front each access, no shop window. But I had to apply for temporary accommodation for a number of years, and eventually that, that, that moved on. So it's important that we look at reusing our town centres, getting sustainable use from them, and I have no doubt that living in our town centres is an important element for that. And it's important that we refresh our planning policies and the support and grants that are available to support it. As has been indicated, there was a, a previous living over the shop scheme which supported some 11 areas throughout Northern Ireland. My constituency 
uh, in particular the town centres of Larne and Carrick Fergus, was not supported. Many other town centres were not supported from the previous scheme, and therefore the potential for it and the potential for it helping those town centres and helping the level of homelessness in those areas uh, is perhaps greater than others. Now, in moving forward, it's important that we come up with a scheme that will work, not one that we tick all our own personal boxes. I think in terms of other schemes which have tried to improve the town centres in my constituency, the Heritage Lottery Fund has been useful for some properties, but it uh, brings out specifications, which means other property, property owners leave them vacant. They don't think it's worthwhile. They, they, perhaps it's in a conservation area where there's a very high cost to follow what would be required by Heritage Lottery. So it's important we adapt our planning policies to actually make sure something happens, to make sure the high levels of vacancies are addressed, to be bringing life back into those town centres and provide the homes that we all want. Others have talked, uh, Mr. Drogan earlier talked about how there is a potential of actually bringing about quick change here. Uh, we have the, the building already made. It's, you're talking about modifying buildings. And I suspect, in terms of the overall cost, it's probably more efficient than building new homes from scratch. So we have a, a homeless issue throughout Northern Ireland, not just in some areas. There are huge pressures of finding homes for families, for individuals. Uh, uh, throughout our towns and cities of Northern Ireland. I think it's important that we come up with a scheme that will apply widely and not just concentrate in some areas. I think going forward, uh, I, I would like to highlight the, the report uh, which was commissioned, uh, or was, sorry, was published in 2016. That's been a useful review of the Living Over the Shop scheme uh, and it's very, very detailed. For instance, it identifies 30 properties in the town of Larne with the potential for such a scheme being rolled out, 10 in Ballymena and, and, and 20 within Carrick Fergus, the other uh, town centre within my constituency. So, yes, I certainly will. I thank the member for giving way. And, and in reference to the very report, would he agree with me that it is quite clear that the evidence and the analysis of a living over the shop scheme is there and it's in place. Now is about getting on with the job and delivering practical schemes which support our town centres. The member has an additional minute. I, I, I agree entirely with the member. And looking at this report, I think it was September 2016, that report has sat on the shelf for virtually four years when this assembly wasn't here. We've had the homeless issue get worse during that period. The, the ideas that were contained in the report have sat there. They have not been addressed. It's important that we go on and deal with it now. But it's important also that we come up with pra pragmatic schemes that will work. If they do not work with those who ha or own the property, if they do not work with potential tenants, if they do not work with perhaps other uh, uh, potential uh, partners, perhaps uh, housing associations, they will not happen. So it's important in designing a scheme, we get a scheme that will work so we, we can provide the homes that are badly needed and revitalise our town centres and improve the footfall and the feeling of safety of people who are living there. Thank you. Ms Kelly Armstrong. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, I've listened to the debate today. Um, I can see the merits in both the main motion and the amendment, but I have to say on behalf of the Alliance Party that we will be supporting the main motion and not the amendment today. And the reason for that is, is if the grant scheme had have been included in the amendment, then we could have supported both together. I think both are well-intentioned and both are needed, but there does need to be the grant scheme. The report that uh, Mr Beggs has talked about today back in 2016 has already identified that people, uh, businesses, landlords, and departments have recognised the need for a grant income to convert those spaces above um, commercial properties in order to make them habitable. Um, communities is therefore already aware of the need to grant support um, and the est establishment of living over shops scheme. Um, in the new decade, new approach, the executive parties all agreed to a housing outcome. Um, I'm looking at Mr Durkin here, it was an SDLP approach that was brought forward and we all agreed to it. I look forward to seeing that outcome developed with clear, clear indicators to achieve better housing. And I think that, to be honest, the living over the shops is one of those aspects that needs to be concluded if we are to achieve the amount of housing that we need for all of our people across Northern Ireland. 
It is time to move forward the option to develop more living spaces, given the demand for housing is growing. And that's why I can't just go with the amendment, because it talks about the minister, who is very committed to housing, going to the executive co co colleagues to talk about it. In the situation that we're in at the moment, to be honest, there's so much on the executive's plate. I want to see the action as opposed to just um, considering what might happen. And I do believe that the minister is the person that will take this forward. What I would like to say about the Living Over the Shops scheme is the reason why we need a grant for it. The shop owner may not be able to provide the money themselves to develop those units. When I mean, you think how many of our towns outside Belfast are charity shops, they can't afford to develop residential places above. There's an opportunity through this grant for us to do something different. And a grant that comes with a caveat it's not a contract, but a grant that comes with a caveat can provide this. So we can consider things like Mr McCann has brought forward, for instance, um, ensure that bins are not stored on the street, that there's actually somewhere provided with the residential property, that it's not, that's not going to happen. That it's sustainable living space, and it has to include alternative fuel sources to reduce carbon emissions and meet our targets. Innovative alternatives to oil tanks is desperately needed if we're to move away from fossil fuels. The space needs to be inclusive not exclusive for people with limited mobility. There are an awful lot of our older generation who are looking for town centre living because they can no longer drive and they use public transport. Living in towns, being together safely in towns, is more important than sitting in a three-bedroom house in the middle of nowhere. We have to consider lifts and accessibility options to residential properties that are above ground on, on the first floor. There needs to be consideration about rates and water charges, because as we know, commercial premises would need to split that off from the residential premises. But we need to think about some other way of getting houses and house space available when there is so little land available. We know that work has been done. There have been mapping out made, for instance, in Belfast, and the amount of land that's available for new housing is very low. Meanwhile, we have a number of single men who are still being denied access to the housing market, and a number of older people who are faced with bedroom tax. I know we're paying that for them at the moment, but time will come when more and more people move on to the benefit system and they will be faced with bedroom tax. I think that we could consider the, town, the Scotland Town Centre Housing Fund, where there's a mix of grant and loan funding. They've done it on a 50-50 basis, and that could reduce a cost to government. Architects and town planners have said to us for years that we need to develop town and city centre living with services that make these spaces welcoming and inclusive rather than frightening and isolated. The last thing that we want to do is to put people into places that where it's uncomfortable for them. But we have the opportunity to say to those people who own commercial premises, we have social landlords out there, social housing options who could come in and take over that space for you. They could buy that space and develop it in a way that would be good for people and meet the objective need because there is no point in putting someone into a house that they're not going to be climb, able to climb stairs, they're not going to be able to afford to hate it or it's not going to be the right space for them. I welcome the motion today. I think that living over the shops is one way that we can get our towns and, and city centres revitalised but all I would say is that it needs done. It doesn't need to be talked about anymore. We need the grants to become a reality, and I absolutely appreciate that money is going to be extraordinarily tight over the next wee while. The but member's can... time is up. Thank you very much. I call Ms. Sinead Ennis. I get, uh, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. I suppose that the crux of Sinn Féin's amendment to the motion uh, before us today is really the need um, to bring the necessary focus on the fact that many people and families do live in housing stress, as a number of members have already outlined, and that we simply do not have the housing stock to meet the need, that we need to begin to address this immediately, and I'm sure members would agree that it would be a far more effective use of public finances. Um, we need our towns and city centres to be vibrant and thriving places to live and work, but that cannot be at the expense of those in the, uh, the greatest need of a home. New Decade New Approach brings focus to build housing in locations of objective need, and Sinn Féin believe adequate housing is a human right, and we will continue to promote this across the island. The level of homelessness north and south needs to be addressed, and Sinn Féin have an ambitious and viable target of building social and affordable housing, housing in line with objective need. While this motion and the amendment talks specifically about our towns and city centres. As a rural MLA in South Down, I feel it would be remiss of me not to mention that rural housing needs have been neglected for far too long. 
The Housing Executive retains oversight of new build but has a poor record of coordinate, coordinating new build in line with objective need and in line with the Rural Needs Act. Housing development in rural locations has missed its target over each of the last five years. And the, the Housing Executive's rural and place shaping teams need to work with rural communities and their representatives to examine their housing needs and support housing associations in the delivery of new build schemes to address housing need. There are approximately 60 housing association, housing association houses sold each year and 300 housing association homes, sorry, housing executive homes. This stock, as we know, is never being replaced. New build isn't adequately, adequately located in the areas of highest need. The latest housing figures show over 37,000 applicants on the social housing waiting list, and of these applicants, more than 26,000 were in housing stress. The private rented sector plays a big role in meeting housing need, as, as does the social, social housing sector, and therefore there has been a significant increase in the proportion of households with children living in the private rented, um, private rented accommodation. As the member for Foyle has already outlined, research undertaken by the Centre of Cities 2015 has shown that city centre residents are more likely to be young, single students or professionals. However, almost a third of those experience, experiencing housing stress are families. Indeed, many families are already struggling to obtain their own home in unfair conditions of overcrowding and young families still being penalised for the housing crash over a decade ago. And this amendment brings a further emphasis to support them. The DEP's motion, while on the surface, may look to have merit. It does, however, exclude public money being used to help support those into accommodation who need it most and on the basis of objective need. Sinn Féin supports efforts to revitalise our towns and city centres, and we are very much open to exploring the best options to enhance both social and economic recovery. But the social aspect is completely omitted from the DEP's motion, and that is why we would find it difficult to support the motion as it stands. Go ahead. Does the member accept that some 11 areas already had this scheme and there are many other parts of Northern Ireland that has never been afforded as of yet and that that should be a major consideration? I didn't actually quite hear your comments there, but I mean, go, go ahead, yeah. Uh, I, I remember the scheme uh, back then and it was brought in, I believe, under the, uh, the housing-led regeneration, which had a particular focus. And that if you look at Belfast, the five areas chosen, uh, for it were five unionist areas, and there were, was very little uh, resources pointed towards nationalist areas, and that's the facts of life of this scheme back then. Thank you. Um, the member just, has an additional minute. Okay, thank you. Just, I'm going to conclude anyway. Sinn Féin's amendment is about maintaining the support and supply of accommodation necessary to help struggling families, along with their most vulnerable, to access housing and have security and dignity, and therefore I would ask members to support the amendment. Gormoigit. Thank you. I call Mr. Pat Catney. Thank you very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, though COVID has added focus to the need to aid the prosperity of our city centres, the issue impacting on them have long predated COVID and will exist even after we recover from this pandemic. The benefits of living over the shop scheme are not just economic, we have a massive housing shortage and affordability issues. Anything that can be done to tackle this must be welcome. Living over the shop properties are also more affordable. They are more affordable to create than new residential bills, and more importantly, they are cheaper to buyers and renters. Changes in demographic and household types are also apparent. Living over the shop schemes provides vital accommodation to our young and single persons households. We have severe lack of one two bedroom properties, which is putting stress on our private and social housing market. This is a simple and effective way of dealing with this. Living over that shop schemes are also tied into urban regeneration work. They revitalise town centres without the need for destruction and the eroding of character of our town centres. They enhance the areas, bringing life and vibrancy back into them. In fact, I just want to say quickly, uh, uh, my mother and father lived above the shop in the city centre. Uh, the only other two people in behind that ring of steel, which was then the commercial heart of Belfast, was the caretaker and his wife, uh, who lived above the Masonic Lodge in Corn Market. The point I'm trying to make by bringing this to, uh, to your mind is this has to be done with planning, and we can't use a blunt instrument like compulsory purchase in order to move those people that find themselves living in city centres out. The benefit to our town and city centre economies cannot be more clear. 
My parents, as I've already said, lived above the bar for most of their lives. They brought groceries in a family-owned store across the road, brought food from the family-owned butchers on the next street, and brought their clothes in the family-owned stores next to them. In turn, these family businesses and their owners and their customers came into the bar and helped my parents in order to sustain their businesses. In the days of online shopping, these micro-economies are the only way to keep our towns and city centre businesses going. Statistics show our own town centres have an average of 20% non-domestic vacancies uh, levels. A mix of grant and loan schemes for over-the-shop properties in Scotland have proven to be popular. This can bring populations into our city centres and therefore bring revenue to our city centre businesses. In closing, these schemes will help our small business owners, Mr Speaker, help provide regenerator cities and town centres and provide people with affordable and practical housing that allows uh, them to live, prosper and enjoy the places where they live. It is a simple solution with a massive impact. I urge you all to support the amendment and the motion. Thank you. Mr John Blair. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. I, I rise to support the motion. Thank those uh, through you who brought it, uh, but cannot uh, support the amendment for reasons, mainly those highlighted by my colleague Kelly Armstrong, which I don't need to repeat, um, around grants and other issues, but uh, more importantly, the need, Principal Deputy Speaker, to move from exploration to action. The motion provides a new opportunity, I believe, to uh, the member for given way. I was going to interject, uh, Ms. Armstrong. Well, I, I certainly concur that it is the time for action rather than exploration. But will the member accept that the motion that he is going to support merely calls on the minister to consider? Such a scheme, that's the action, which is about the same as explores such a scheme that the amendment calls for. The member has an additional minute. Thank you, President Deputy Speaker. I am content with the wording of the motion as illustrated, and I'm sure that the member would agree that some of the reports we've talked about and heard about here already today have been around for, for, for years, so we could resume. Uh, President Deputy Speaker, the motion provides a new opportunity to kick start initiatives aimed at refreshing town centres. It also offers the potential to revitalise town centres by, by repurposing empty premises above shops, accommodation which in many cases has been vacant for some time, or has been neglected, or has fallen into disrepair. Such initiatives could provide additional housing at competitive prices also, simply by, you could suggest, looking upwards, and provide opportunity to tackle the acute shortage of housing, particularly social and genuinely affordable housing which, as we know, has led to spiralling rent and house prices in many parts of the country. There is, I would suggest, also potential economic benefit. The return of residents can benefit the business below commercially, provide potential staff, perhaps, and repopulate urban twilight zones. People will be interested in the local area, its upkeep and its amenities. There could also, in some instances, be, of course, a greater contribution to local rates revenue. We should, I think, also try to harness the environmental benefit of ideas on this issue, around us on this issue. Not driving to the shops or to work, but rather walking or cycling reduces congestion and consequently air pollution, which is good for the environment, of course. There are, Principal Deputy Speaker, some matters, however, on which I would sound some caution. Living above the shop can have a downside, or potential downsides. A previously desirable home may lose its allure if the retail outlet, such as a bookshop downstairs, suddenly closes and a fried food outlet opens in its place. There could be issues around social isolation, having no immediate neighbours, particularly for those who are vulnerable or those in need of support or a social network, a neighbourhood feeling or, for some people, belonging to a community. Other issues that need to be looked at include security. Sure. Except that living in a town centre can bring opportunities as well, because there are libraries, there are numerous um, groups that will meet in the town centre. So yes, I appreciate there are risks and there's a potential for isolation, but there's much potential for networking and benefiting those individuals who choose to live there. Uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, I thank the member for the intervention. Hopefully, you, Principal Deputy Speaker, and members will agree. I have just previously highlighted a number of positives around living in a town centre, and I will come to some potential solutions for the, the uh, notes of caution that are, are rising now. I mentioned fire precautions separate from the shop, 
uh, probability of high traffic noise, access issues. There needs to be a separate entrance and ideally one in a well-lit and clearly visible place. Uh, there are ways to ensure that these areas of concern do not outweigh the benefits that I have highlighted previously through, for example, coordination of planning and implementation, by ensuring interdepartmental and interagency working on the issues that I have highlighted, through area planning and joined up working between different levels of government to highlight those pitfalls and provide solutions. Uh, with those in mind and the fact that those, those potential problems do not outweigh the benefits, happy to support the motion, Principal Deputy Speaker. Ms. Claire Bailey. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. Um, and I am raising, and the Green Party will be supporting this motion as amended today. And we do that because we believe that housing is a right, not a luxury, and neither is it a commodity to be bought, sold, and traded for financial gain. But unfortunately, that's what we have become, uh, and this is leaded leading to inflated prices, inflated land values and inflated profits within the private housing sector. We are not in the same situation as our neighbours in Dublin or London just yet, but we are heading there, make no mistake about it. For example, as of March 2019, there were just under 40,000 people on our housing waiting lists, um, and yet in the financial year 2018-19, we built less than 1,000 new social homes, and at the same time, 7,000 were built in the private sector. This Assembly cannot stand over a situation that places restrictions on our largest housing provider, our largest house, social housing provider, sorry, um, to create new homes while simultaneously providing grant incentives to the private sector. And the Department of Communities' own review into a previous similar scheme remarked about the relatively low risk and high reward available to the prospective recipients of grant funding. It seems that some have not learned lessons from previous mistakes for this type of proposal. The over-provision of HMOs in areas such as my own in South Belfast, which have decimated some neighbourhoods and communities, have created social and environmental problems and have cost millions each year for statutory agencies in trying to manage but HMOs and lots do serve a purpose, but only when used properly and only with appropriate controls and planning. So that's why I believe the amendment represents a much more balanced and proportionate response to this issue. We do need more high quality, affordable and long term homes. And we do know that single men between the ages of 26 and 59 make up the highest proportion of people on our housing waiting list. We know that we need more one- and two-bedroom housing units, which lots type of accommodation could help with. But driving more people into the private sector with rising rents is not the answer. The Nevin Economic Research Institute research on housing in Northern Ireland is very clear that affordability is a major issue in the private rental sector because costs are simply too high. And sadly, some of our own housing association rents are also pushing up the boundary of what we consider affordable. We know that we need to reimagine our towns and city centres long before COVID hit, but it has provided us with another reason and opportunity to build back better. And housing-led regeneration is a way forward. Our towns and city centres should be places where people want to live, and there's no quick fix. We can't just throw public money at private property owners to create some new flats and bed sets and expect regeneration to somehow happen on its own. Certainly will. Way. But I want to just ask the member that sometimes some of these old buildings are historical buildings, uh, like Victorian buildings, and we have lost an awful lot of our built heritage. It is just a case of trying to give another lifeline to those businesses which are trying to operate within them. I am sure the member sees that as a risk as well. Thank the member for his contribution Ms. there. Billy, and it's something that you, I will be. You have an additional minute. Thank you. Sorry. I will be addressing exactly that point in a second. Um, but we do need to create livable, breathable urban spaces with good quality housing, green spaces, no congestion, access to health centres, schools, parks, and have a butcher, baker and candlestick maker all within your living space. We do not need to give away grants to create more private rental accommodation um, to make any of this happen. Would the member get Yeah, go ahead. 
I, I share uh, the, the idealistic vision that, that you are creating, but I'm just wondering how is it going to be delivered? There is government uh, borrowing restrictions which limit the public funds that is available. So if there's not a partnership of some sort with housing associations, with the, public, with the private sector, are you not going to just be looking for a vision and not deliver it? Thank the member um, that for your contribution there, and I assure you that it's not idealistic. It's experience that I'm speaking from. I'm speaking from the experience of a mother who was forced out of private rental due to high rents and lived in a hostel for many, many months before being offered a house and social housing. So there's where my ideals come from. But it's not enough that landlords uh, f to make lots available. Um, then perhaps we should be looking a wee bit more closely at why this might be happening. What public policy could be contributing to this? Landlords are already incentivised to sit with vacant commercial property in terms of our rating system. Developers are also incentivised to knock down and rebuild rather than repurpose and reuse um, under our VAT system. In the context of our climate emergency, the impact it has on our carbon em emissions is unforgivable, never mind what this has meant exactly to the point that the previous member made on our built heritage across our province. We can do things better. We can encourage landlords to use their properties better, but we should also be using public money better. So let's work on that. Let's put our focus in, the meet in meeting the needs of our constituents in a sustainable way. Let's use public resource to create public housing at a scale that is actually needed. I'm sorry, Let's redesign our planning system and make it fit for purpose today and focus on creating happier, happier and healthier Northern Ireland for all. Thank, Thank you. you. I call Mr Jerry Carroll. Uh, thanks, Mr Deputy Speaker. It, it is uh, undoubtedly the case uh, that city centre and town centre living uh, would go some way to alleviating local housing crises across the north, in particular in inner city communities. And we must ensure that when we're talking about uh, increased housing across the north, uh, it is first and foremost about getting people the homes they need, and secondly, about doing it in a sustainable and affordable uh, manner. Unfortunately, that doesn't seem to be the intention uh, behind the DUP motion here today. And to me, uh, it seems to be in line with the recent approach to COVID. Uh, the motive is highlighted blatantly to simply get businesses in city centres generating profit again. Um, indeed, this motion comes hot on the heels, Mr Deputy Speaker. You'll be well aware of the sign-off of the Tribeca um, development at Belfast City Centre, which was opposed by campaign groups uh, and the thousands of submissions because it presented a threat to social housing, open space, uh, arts and culture, built heritage, as we heard already, uh, and included uh, thousands of square feet uh, of office space. But unfortunately, it was pushed ahead by both the DUP and Sinn Féin. Uh, we can and must do better, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, when planning the future for our town centres to put people's needs first and guarantee sustainability over making a, a quick buck for landlords or big business owners. How many? I'll take a point, yeah. Thank the member for giving way. And while I welcome his initial comments about the need for, for housing space, particularly in our town centres, would he not note the intention and genuine spirit of this motion, which is to look at the thousands of vacant properties within our town centres and note that without a scheme in place to support landlords who are already struggling, we will not be able to provide this additional space within town centres to allow people to live and make our cities and towns vibrant once again. Before I call Mr Carroll, can I remind members, intervention should be brief. Uh, Mr Carroll, you have an additional minute. Thank you. Well, I would remind the member that there isn't a, a great practice of uh, grants uh, being handed out in this uh, building uh, through various departments and them being fair, accessible uh, and uh, public money well spent a remind him of RHI. So I think there, there has to be concerns raised over uh, the kind of grant scheme that, that he is and his party is suggesting. Um, and I would just to continue in my speech, Mr uh, Deputy Speaker, um, how many high quality premium apartments did we see flood the market in Belfast alone when COVID hit and tourists couldn't travel uh, here? enough to prove that these kind of apartments aren't always built with the people uh, who live here in mind. And to go further, Mr Speaker, uh, we would like to see the executive uh, enable uh, the housing executive to 
to buy and develop many of these spaces to uh, throw open uh, town and city centres to people stuck uh, on waiting lists. We think that is the best approach to dealing with the housing crisis in our communities. We are not in favour of planning ahead with the profit-driven development of our city centres that has seen hotel- hoteliers, businesses given primacy over the objective needs of our communities for uh, too many times. And we are not alone, Mr Deputy Speaker. Academic research says we must uh, move towards more sustainable planning, and the COVID-19 crisis has exposed this um, more than ever, and has exposed the uh, problematic fragility of the direction taken by the executive over the past 10 years in, in this matter. Mr. Speaker, we are for the development of homes in the city centre, but they must be built or developed so they are affordable and o- up to environmental standards. Therefore, I cannot support the DEP motion here today, but I will support the amendment. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, no other member has indicated the wish to participate in the debate. Uh, so I call the Minister to respond to the debate. Uh, the Minister for Communities, Carol Killen, will have 15 minutes. Minister. Thank you very much, Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, I want to thank the contributors to the debate up until now, and I also welcome the opportunity to speak on the motion. So, firstly, uh, in relation to addressing the question about living over the shops, um, and the, indeed, the debate brought this out um, in a much broader sense. But, however, uh, I fully recognise the role um, of repurposed and attractive space can play in the success of town centres and making high streets a desirable place to live. Um, however, my priority is providing accessible, quality public housing for those in most need, housing in quality neighbourhoods with access to suitable amenities repurposing vacant or underused commercial premises as homes can have a role to play. However, the basis for my department to intervene with a subsidy to the private housing market will always be around the provision of public housing allocated on the basis of objective need, given the scale of housing stress that was mentioned here today as part of this debate. You have all got the background notes on the Living Over the Shop scheme. The Department funded the scheme for conversion projects from commercial to private residential properties, and the scheme was aimed to encourage the development of homes in empty spaces above high street shops and was targeted primarily at creating private homes for sale or rent. So the LOT scheme was then an attempt to help urban centres by providing housing and reusing buildings. However, the scheme closed to new applicants in 2009 not only due to budgetary constraints, but its failure, absolute failure to deliver on anticipated outcomes. An independent review of the scheme supported this analysis. It was a grant scheme. It did not make any significant difference in, t- in terms of housing supply or regeneration, and focus then moved on to other work which held more promise. The result the report was clear that there were numerous issues causing the underutilisation of formal, former commercial space in towns and city centres. And some of these issues have been raised today, issues like planning, built and control, health and safety, financing, insurance, rates, the layout of the building, disability access. The provision of a small grant scheme or any grant scheme did not significantly overcome these issues, and as a result, the scheme hardly managed to deliver any homes. And moreover, as funding was directed, private and public funding was directed towards the provision of private dwellings, there is no increase, there was no increase in the delivery for public housing. So I personally see no evidence that any of this has changed. And I want to be clear, I do not have any plans to reinstate, under any circumstances, living over the shop scheme. Indeed, the provision of a public subsidy to support the creation of new homes by private developers, potentially at the expense of additional public housing, is something I will not support. No. Given the high level of housing stress here, my primary focus will be on increasing the supply of public housing in future. A grant scheme for developers which does not aim to specifically increase the provision of public housing is not part of my plans. As I mentioned at the start, that does not mean 
I'm not going to look at options or a range of other measures to help reimagine or regenerate our towns and cities. However, uh, putting public money into vacant shop spaces while there is such a growing need for social housing cannot be reconciled. My department is therefore committed to finding new and innovative ways of uh, increasing the supply and indeed the affordability of housing. I welcome our councils are supporting us through their local development plans to increase the provision of housing in their towns and cities. My department has undertaken a wide range of work to assist councils to develop and implement affordable house, housing policies through the local development plan process, and my officials are keen to continue to collaborate with councils on this very important work. And some of this work includes an advice note on delivering affordable housing with planning conditions for new, any new housing development, a new definition of affordable housing, scoping new types of intermediate housing, including new initiatives within the private rented sector, such as below market intermediate rents, partnering with Belfast City Council in part to fund a study to understand the viability of housing development, including affordable housing provision. The Housing Executive is also engaged with councils at a strategic and scheme basis to ensure housing need is addressed locally. My officials are also working with local authorities on urban regeneration projects and programmes which have a strong housing element, and I would like to highlight some of the work that we are doing. So, for example, in Belfast, a key policy objective we share with Belfast City Council is to increase the residential population living in the city centre and around the city core in line with the local development plan. And this will include the provision of 20% social in, in affordable housing and proposed schemes. One example of this process in action is my department's input into the strategic site assessments con conducted by Council, which identified a number of key sites currently owned by Belfast City Council. But it is not just Belfast, where my department has taken practical steps to help regenerate our urban uh, centres and provide housing. Right across the north, we are involved in mixed use regeneration schemes, which will deliver affordable and more, so more social homes. These efforts will undoubtedly improve the economic and social fabric of our town centres. It is clear that there are problems currently faced by towns and city centres, and this needs to be addressed as part of the TEO High Street Task Force. There was a clear lesson in the Living Over the Shops pilot. There are fundamental and issues which went beyond the influence of this scheme. The focus on any future intervention from my department will always remain to target those in most need, and I firmly believe that this focus should be increasing supply to reduce the demand. In the meantime, the Department for Communities will continue to work actively to engage with councils and indeed with other, body, other bodies, uh, particularly in rural communities, to work with their local plans. Now, in relation to some of the um, contributions. Um, Jonathan Buckley moved the motion and spoke about the need to revitalise, revitalise our towns uh, and city centres, um, and certainly given the economic conditions that we are living in, hardly anyone could you know, dispute that. However, you know, wedging public money for housing for landlords is not happening. Fran McCann moved the amendment and spoke about the previous policy and the previous spend, and highlighted the roles that councils are playing in other plans and developments, and spoke about particularly the, the, the challenge that was faced in the past about delivering effective outcomes, and one of those was about inclusion. Mark, you can check these figures out, but I think West Belfast is the highest, North Belfast is next, and then Foyles after that. But to be frank, we are not good. They are in the top three. They have been persistently in the top three because there has been systematic inequality in housing for decades, and that needs to change. So, for example, Mark, spoke about, Mark Durkin spoke about the need to look at opportunities, not only just to have greater supply, but also to ensure that as many housing delivered, good quality housing delivered, without rushing to give grants out, and that is quite appropriate. 
Roy Beggs uh, spoke next um, in relation to supporting the motion and not the amendment, and spoke about planning concerns and con conservation concerns and planning policies. Um, and while all of those are correct, um, I think it goes back to the point that Pat made. I grew up in Carrie Hill, very great Victorian character, not great plumbing, outside toilets, overcrowding, four generations live under one roof. As twee, not as twee, but as good as our upbringing was, and we have happy memories, and there were good memories, and they did ground us all. Um, I know that given the housing figures and some of the areas of highest demand, you're going to have families getting brought up in a, 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 in a place where it's only meant for a, a one or two bedroom person on their own with no children. Um, I also felt that you know Kelly and I were on the committee along with Fra and Mark. Um, <clears throat> And I do think there's a nervousness with the alliance around objective need. I honestly do, because I found both your contribution and John's convoluted and confused. While you support the motion and not the amendment, you spoke about NDNA, you, they spoke about the need for inclusive space, and then went on to talk about some of the concerns around Minister, access. Minister, I'm, I'm loath to interrupt, but you really shouldn't refer to other members as you or you in the debate. If we could just try to keep it through the chair. So, uh, uh, apologies. Apologies. Um, so, um, but the, the issue for me is that I think there's a general acceptance that we've got a housing crisis and we need to look at ways in which to do it. But I just don't personally agree with some of the, no thanks, with some of the um, ways in which um, the members had suggested. Sinead Ennis also spoke about the NDNA uh, commitment around objective need and particularly in relation to some of the uh, Sinn Féin proposals as part of those negotiations were around removing corporation tax and removing the historic debt to allow the housing executive to build more homes despite the fact of pointing out and she is right that they have missed targets each year while some years is an explanation they need to be a bigger champion I need to be a better advocate for people who are homeless and on the housing waiting list than what they currently are. Um, I want to thank um, Claire um, for bringing her experience in, because I sometimes think that that's missing. Um, and I, I commend the member for South Belfast for her dignity in not responding to the mansplaining that was tried by Mr Beggs. Um, anyone who loses her home in the private rented sector with two small children to go into a hostel is exactly the reason why this amendment needs to be supported and not the motion, in my opinion. And Jerry Carl spoke about the sustainability and the affordability as an issue, as did many other members, and that is the case. Um, housing executive and housing association rents need to be better reconciled. As we've mentioned before, we have people who are refusing housing association homes because they can't afford the rent. And the rent within the private rented sector, even with a public subsidy, is higher than it needs to be. And I do think there is a mission creep going on here. It is a renter's market. And I believe that some of the people who really need social housing not only deserve it, but you know, been held. In a, in a situation where they're almost locked into private rented accommodation and feel of nowhere to go is absolutely horrendous. And I too have been there myself with small children. Um, I do think there's a lot to be said, particularly in relation to when we talk about city centre living. And I just want to end on this. Carrick Hill, the market, the Strand, um, all around York Road, they have been part of the city well before a lot of these other places in Belfast emerged. And those communities are still there generations later. And I do believe each of us would have examples of that in our own towns and villages. And it is important to try and sustain communities and try to sustain families. But we also have to be honest. The by and large, the private sector has played a role and has played an important role. I'm not saying that it hasn't a role to play. However, what is not acceptable is that the private rented sector has now been used to deliver a public and statutory duty and obligation, and that is not acceptable. And public money should not be put into the private rented sector 
at the detriment of people who need a social home. So I thank the members for their contributions uh, and the opportunity to contribute to this debate. Thank you, uh, Minister. As question time begins at 2 p.m., and there are then two oral urgent questions after that, I suggest that the House take its ease until then. Uh, this debate will continue after question time and the two uh, urgent oral questions. And the next member to speak will be Mr. Cahill Boylan to wind on the amendment. So the House could take its ease for a few moments for a change at the table, please. Okay, members, we now return to the debate on the motion Living Over the Shop Scheme, and I call on uh, Cahill Boylan to wind on the amendment. You will have five minutes. Uh, and thank you, uh, Mr Speaker, and I welcome the opportunity to take part in the debate. And it has been an interesting debate. Um, and we all know, many as a member will certainly support our towns and try and revitalise our towns, there's no doubt about it. But um, in listening to my colleagues, and, and I, I'll bow to Mr. Fran McCann, he's not, he's not in the chamber at the minute, but he's been an expert in this field for a long and many day. He was in the old DST committee, along with my former colleague Mickey Brady, so he's well, he's well versed. But there's just a, a few points that I, I want to pick up, and then I'll pick up on some of the members' comments, because it's quite interesting. Obviously, some of the members didn't read either the motion or didn't read the amendment, um, because the original motion is asking for consideration of the minister. Um, and members, clearly, some members who commented, um, especially Mr. Blair, um, in an intervention with uh, Mr. Durkin from Derry, it was clearly seen that they, they hadn't really read the. Uh, the motion or the amendment. Um, but it's, it's quite interesting um, if you look at it, because Mr Begg is not in the chamber either, and he mentioned, he mentioned the 2016 report was sitting, sitting on the shelf for uh, four years. But if you read some of the um, comments from some of those, I mean, there was um, in 2016, in June of 2016, I remember the proposal of the motion would know this here, but if you read this at the time, he certainly wouldn't have included this in some of, his, some of the original motion. Um, in June 2016, a selection of property agents across all 11 council areas were consulted to obtain their views on revitalised living over the shops scheme. All of the agents felt that currently the refurbishment of vacant accommodation in city and town centres is not currently viable, as the level of rents are not sufficient to provide an adequate, adequate investment return on the cost to carry out refurbishment to a standard that will meet building regulations and a finish that will attract tenants. And if people had been listening to that or had seen that, they certainly wouldn't be coming along um, today in relation to. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Thank the member for giving way. But on that point, would he would he not? Uh, if, if he had, I think he was in for the start of the debate. But I did mention that of the 3,595 non-domestic property vacancies, Northern Irish councils have identified that 1,015 of those would be suitable for residential conversion. And as, as he well pointed out, the housing stress that we're under, certainly that could go some way in helping. Mr. Boyle. Thank you. And I thank the member for the intervention. Yes, I've, take, I've taken notes, certainly, in relation to uh, the member introducing his this motion or to the floor. I mean, when you're talking about levels of twenty-five thousand and up to fifty thousand pounds of interventions in some of these cases, which is in the report, um, it's a lot of money. It, it's about public spend, and it's about um, looking after our people and proper spend within our town centres. And that's what this is about, to be to be honest. Um, but I just want to turn to some of the members' uh, contributions. Because it's, it's interesting, the member did release it when he, he moved the motion. He turned around, he talked. Um, he's referring to the minister, mentioned the minister um, consider introducing the scheme. But still, in all, in his contribution, he said he wanted direct action across the executive. And if he had to say, like, he's saying one thing, why then didn't he remember consider putting something in the motion in relation to? Direct action, because I think there's other ways 
on other means, and obviously the Minister has already resp responded to the debate. I'm not going to uh, repeat all she said. But it's interesting, you know, when the member is talking about the footfall being down 79 per cent, certainly in April, and all, all the points he's mentioned, nobody would argue uh, about the decline of our high streets. There's no doubt about it. But it's how we go about revitalising them. He's talking about online shopping, and online shopping has hit all of the towns. There's no doubt about all the areas. So it's just in some of his commentary. Um, there's other ways and other means, and I think there's other agencies has to play a part, and local councils. Mr. Begg talked about uh, planning, and he's, he's mentioned planning on a number of committees and a number of things. Yes, planning policy, the local area plans has a, has a big part to play in the revitalisation, and, and the minister alluded to to some of the stuff that the um, that the uh, Belfast had done in terms of trying to revitalise theirs. Let me finish. It is, I'm afraid, because sorry. it's a time debate. You sorry, I thought, I thought next amendment. Sorry, sorry about that. I, I support the amendment. Grand. Um, the next person then to conclude and wind up the debate on the motion, who will have 10 minutes, is Mr. Robin Newton. Uh, thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and uh, can I thank uh, my colleague, uh, Mr. Buckley, and indeed my colleague, Palm Cameron, for bringing. Sorry. Palm Bradley for bringing the motion forward, and Palm should have been winding up, but has unfortunately had to go home because of some domestic uh, problems. Uh, when I was uh, asked to, to wind up, I was trying to think about some uh, initial introductory remarks uh, uh, about uh, the motion itself and about the issues uh, around the motion, and it was sort of came to mind that I, I suppose if you think about maybe who was the most famous politician ever to live above the shop, you come to the name Margaret Thatcher uh, and, and her political career. But then we were reminded during the course of the debate that Pat Catney also <laughs> lived, lived above uh, the, the, the shop. And it certainly hasn't done him any, any uh, great harm. In, in his political career. And I suppose uh, I was, and I have to say this, I was extremely disappointed, extremely disappointed by the minister's response. Because I know the minister, I know the minister wants to provide housing for constituents. I know that. But I was extremely disappointed with the minister's response where she just dismissed it. In fact, a forceful rejection of the scheme. And indeed, she said she wouldn't even be considering such a scheme. No matter how good, no matter how different, no matter how it might be worked up, no matter what the priorities were, no matter where the finance come from, she wouldn't even be considering such a scheme. And I have to say, Minister, for all of those people who are currently on the growing waiting list, I would feel for them in their need for, for housing. And whether or not you like, whether or not you think, whether or not you think it's appropriate for people to live in the city centre and contribute to the city centre, I was also looking at the, the value of, of city centre living. Now, in London, you can buy, and this is a buy situation, in an area known as Buckingham. You can pay £240,000 for a, sh a flat above a shop. If you want to live close to Del Boy, you can buy in Peckham a two-bedroom flat for nearly £300,000. And if you want to lo live above a fish and chip shop in Mayfair, you can pay £5 million for that privilege. Now, that's successful use of housing in London. Maybe not the intention, maybe not the area that we want to cover, but it indicates that it's possible to do the job of successfully living and that people will pay huge amounts of money to live there. So we need to consider, Minister, we need to consider how we can make use of vacant space in city centres. And I do know, I do know Minister, that and it has been referred to by others, had been referred to by others, the need for a, a strategic approach to, to delivering 
such a scheme as this. And Mr. Buckley, uh, eloquently in, in his proposing of the scheme, indicated that you would need to have the statutory bodies such as the councils uh, on board and that they have a major role to play in how this might be developed. My own feeling is you also need to have the arterial routes as suppliers of folk to, 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 to uh, uh, live in the city uh, and feed into the city. We also need to consider, and Mr Buckley in his remarks indicated this, that the outlying towns and villages also need to be considered and how their high streets might indeed benefit from such an initiative. And that strategic approach, Minister, does need to be considered rather than just dismissed. Such major schemes, uh, I don't think, cannot go forward without the specialist input. Those who are experienced in town and country planning, those who are experienced architects, those with imagination on how such a scheme can contribute. And I, and I noted that uh, Kelly Armstrong in her remarks indicated about the need for uh, play areas and, and green spaces and so on to, to make sure that it's an attractive area for families to live and work and play. And with such schemes, I think, do need to be, to be considered by a holistic approach and a team approach and everyone playing their, their part. We also need the potential of residents, tenants who may live in the properties, to have a need for security of tenure. And this is where uh, the Minister for Communities, whoever that minister might be, has a role. need to make sure that the, the shops that are existing in close proximity need responsible tenants. And there's always the fear, I think, if you're living above a restaurant or fast food outlet or that nature, of, of the potential dangers that, that, that you, you, you're, you're perhaps increasing. Families need, obviously, the facilities. They need the play parks. They need the, the doctor's surgery. They need the schools close by. But these are all factors that can be taken into consideration, Minister, as such a scheme makes its contribution to solving uh, the housing problem. I'll turn now to the sort of winding up and what others were saying. And obviously there was a, a, a variety of, of, of responses. Um, Mr McCann, he indicated that he was not uh, for, he's not in the, 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 the chamber, indicated that he would not be supporting the, 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 the uh, motion, but would support the amendment. And indeed, he indicated, and I use his expression, that there was a, 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 a need to deal with the tangled web, was how he put it, and that the minister was willing to discuss all issues with the committee. Well, the minister's not willing to discuss this issue or this approach uh, with, with the committee. Mr. Uh, Mark Durkin, and he highlighted the need for his own city uh, uh, and the needs that are there uh, and the problems in his own constituency and acknowledged that there was a need to address this issue. And I know from my, my time on the committee that this is a, a, an issue that is close to his heart as well. And uh, he said we need to learn from the failed schemes of the past, and I agree with him. We do need to learn where there have been failures uh, in, in the past. Mr. Beggs uh, indicated a need for flexibility and the reuse of town centres, indicating that they need to refresh also the planning uh, policies in order that such, as, such schemes as this can go forward. And again, highlighted the homeless uh, problem in, in his constituency, something that affects all of us. Kelly Armstrong, I've already uh, mentioned what Kelly Armstrong, she ha highlighted the need, can't go forward without uh, grant support. Uh, Sinead Ennis from Sinn Féin, she uh, would support only the Sinn Féin amendment, uh, and she so uh, stressed the need to address city centre development. Now, when I look at the, 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 the proposal and the amendment, I'm a bit flummoxed. Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, because in Mr. Buckley's case, he's saying we want to make use of the high streets for high quality locations 
to live as well as work. And the amendment says city centres, by providing additional affordable, accessible and high quality accommodation. And yet we have a big issue. Now it seems to me that we are actually all on the same page on the issue of addressing this, uh, providing additional homes and regenerating at the same time our city centres. Uh, Mr. Pat Cutney, I have already referred to him, but he stressed the affordability of, of lot schemes, potential affordability of lot schemes, and the potential to enhance the area. And I assume he is talking also about, about his constituency and his city uh, of Lisburn and what could happen there. He also indicated that professional experience needs to be, to be brought into play. Uh, Mr John Stewart indicated that uh, certainly this would contribute to the increasing of local uh, rates uh, uh, and indeed highlighted the social potential of, of, of this uh, scheme. Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, I'm sorry I haven't got to everyone's comments, but indeed I think most, most of the members, uh, if not all of the members, made a very positive contribution, albeit I may not have agreed with all that they said. Thank you. The question is that the amendments standing in the names of Sinead Ennis, Fra McCann, Karen Mullen and Cathal Boylan be made. As many as are of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, if any, no. No. Aye. no. Aye. Okay. I think we're going to have a division. It's always good fun. Clear the lobbies. The question will be put in three minutes. I would remind you that we should continue to uphold social distancing and that members who have proxy voting arrangements in place should not come to the chamber. The House will divide. Order. Order. Members will resume their seats, please. Thank you. Before I put the question, I would again remind those members present that, if possible, it would be preferable if we could avoid a division. The question is that the amendments standing in the names of Sinead Ennis, Fra McCann, Karen Mullen and Cathal Boylan be made. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, if any, no. no. Aye. Do we have tellers? Order. Members could resume their seats, please. Thank you. The tellers have been appointed as follows. The tellers for the ayes are Sinead Ennis and Cathal Boylan. The tellers for the noes are Jonathan Buckley and Robin Newton. Before the Assembly divides, I want to remind you that as per Standing Order 112, the Assembly currently has proxy voting arrangements in place. Members who have authorised another member to vote on their behalf are not entitled to vote in person and should not enter the lobbies. I also remind you that social distancing continues to be observed whilst the division is taking place. Please be patient at all times and follow the instructions of the lobby clerks. Clear the lobbies. The assembly will divide. Eyes to my right, noes to my left. Order. Members can please resume their seats. And I'll ask the clerk to please read the result. 81 members voted. 40 members voted aye. 41 members voted no. The amendment therefore falls. The amendment has fallen. Unfasten the doors. Question. No, it's okay. The question therefore is that the motion standing on the order paper be agreed. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, if any. No. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, if any. No. Mr. Carroll is now in the Hansard. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, if any. Thank you. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it.